According to 1 Timothy 3.16, all scripture, by which the author means what the church came to call the Old Testament, is inspired by God and is useful for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. It's not a biology textbook, it's not a romance novel, and it's not a book of answers. Rather, in part, the Bible is useful because it helps us ask the right questions, and at times, it insists those questions be asked. Not only is the Bible a book that helps us ask the right questions, at times it actually poses questions to its readers. These occasions are rare, they are precious, and they are demanding, for they insist that we provide the answers. One example of a narrative ending with a question is the book of Jonah. Jonah, a remarkably whiny prophet, tells the city of Nineveh that if they do not repent, God will destroy them. The city from king to peasant immediately repents, and if the big fish that swallows Jonah were not sufficient indication that the story is fictional, the immediate repentance of Nineveh, the capital of the Assyrian Empire, upon hearing a five-word prophecy, should be. So Jonah, who had hoped that God would destroy the city, sulks. In the last verse of the book of Jonah, God responds, Should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city, in which there were more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? Should I not be concerned? Asked God. Should we not be concerned? The book of Jonah is a parable of sorts. It asks difficult questions, but it couches them in a rollickingly funny story, and it has a happy outcome. Not so with our other question-ending text. In Genesis 34, Jacob's daughter, Dina, sojourning with her family near the city of Shechem, we might think of the family as recent immigrants, is raped by the local prince, also named Shechem. Dina's brothers massacre the prince and every other man in Shechem and then take their wives and children captive. Jacob, Dina's father, excoriates his sons for their violence. Already vulnerable, they have now incurred the enmity of the neighboring tribes and they have to move again. And in the last line of Genesis 34, the brothers respond, should our sister be treated like a whore? The answer, no, God forbid. But the broader questions, what does one say? How does one respond to this? Not so with our other question ending text. In Genesis 34, Jacob's daughter, Dina, sojourning with her family near the city of Shechem, we might think of the family as recent immigrants, is raped by the local prince, also named Shechem. Dina's brothers massacre the prince and every other man in Shechem, and then take their wives and children captive. Jacob, Dina's father, excoriates his sons for their violence, already vulnerable. They have now incurred the enmity of the neighboring tribes, and they have to move again. And in the last line of Genesis 34, the brothers respond, should our sister be treated like a poor? The answer, no, God forbid. But the broader questions remain. What does one say? What should one think? What does one do when sexual assault occurs? Those questions remain. This is a story that asks us questions about the very real, very harsh realities of life. Dysfunctional families, generational divides, ethnic prejudice, rape, revenge, and murder. So who will answer the questions Genesis 34 forces us to face? No woman in the story speaks, not even Dina, who is mentioned in almost every verse. Her name in Hebrew means judgment. Since she is silent, we, her readers, must provide her voice. We must provide judgment a voice. But in seeking this judgment, we will find no easy answers, perhaps no answers at all. Rather, we find the permission to say what we need to say, no matter how difficult to think not only of peace, but also of violence, since that is where our minds will often go anyway. And finally to act, but only after considering the human cost any action might bring. Genesis 34 is a story of rape and its aftermath. Perhaps a story will help us more than the common terms that threaten to become jargon like rape culture, toxic masculinity, systemic patriarchalism, even hashtag me too. Perhaps a story will help us more than yet another depressing list of statistics of sexual assault, which are themselves always underreported, because one rape is one too many. Perhaps a story in the Bible, because it is in the Bible, and because we are in a church this morning, even if virtually, will help us more than another article in the Times or another feature on public radio. 
As a Jew, I cannot turn away from the story. We Jews read the story of Dina every year, or for some congregations every third year, because on the Sabbath we read the entire Torah from the beginning of Genesis to the end of Deuteronomy. The story of Dina is part of a longer reading, Genesis 32, 4 to 36, 43. But for the Christian liturgical year, Genesis 34 is not part of the Sunday lectionary. And sadly, quite a few Christians, and probably quite a few Jews too, are more likely familiar with the 1997 novel and the 2014 TV movie, The Red Tent, loosely based on Genesis 34, than they are with the biblical text. About the novel, the Boston Globe reported, it is tempting to say that the red tent is what the Bible would have been like if it had been written by a woman. No. We women know that life is more than romance. We women, and countless numbers of men, and gender fluid people, we know about rape. The story opens with the notice that Dina, who Leah had born to Jacob, went out to visit the women of the land. This is, as an English major might put it, a fully female identified opening. The verse attests to the importance of mother-daughter relationships, and it depicts a woman interested in meeting with those not of her tribe, her ethnicity, her religion. Dina never meets the women of the land. Shechem came upon her too, too quickly, nor has she any more independent action. The story continues when Shechem, son of Hamor, the Hevite prince of the region, saw her. Vayikach atah, he took her. Vayishchav atah. He laid with her, vayaneha, and he raped her. Yes, biblical scholars note that the Hebrew vayaneha can mean humiliation rather than rape, and some assert that the Hebrew language does not have a word for rape. The New Revised Standard Version translates the term as, he lay with her by force. But that same Hebrew word reappears in 2 Samuel 13, a parallel story to that of Dina where David's daughter Tamar is raped by her brother, the crown prince Amnon. Rape is the correct term. It's a horrible term. Shechem, like Amnon the prince, a privileged son, does whatever he wants to whomever he wants, and he does it with impunity. He expects to get away with it. He knows his powerful father will support him. So what do we think about Shechem? For we have permission to think, even violent ones. Do we want him locked up, and if so, for how long? castrated, executed? Do we want executed all the people who enabled him or protected him or laughed with him when he shared the photos on his phone or posted them to the internet? And what is Dina thinking? Is she on her knees, tears streaming down her face and saying, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The next verse tells us that Shechem's soul, his nephesh in Hebrew, his life force, cleaved to, to Dina, daughter of Jacob. He loved the young woman, and he spoke to her heart. He tells his father, get me this girl, Yalda, girl, with all the connotations of innocence, even childhood. Get me this girl to be my wife. But we learn here that Shechem is not a monster. He's a human being, a man with a soul and a heart and a father. The Bible continues to provoke. The perpetrator is also someone's child. The perpetrator can love. The perpetrator wants to marry his victim. He is also one of us in the image and likeness of God. Until the pandemic, I had been teaching regu regularly at Riverbend Maximum Security Institute here in Nashville. And I would bring 12 Vanderbilt Divinity students to the prison, and we would hold class with 12 insider students, two men convicted of murder, rape, aggravated armed robbery, and child abuse. In reading Genesis at Riverbend, in reading about Cain's murder of Abel, Jacob stealing Esau's blessing, and yes, Shechem's rape of Dina, my insider students insisted that they are more than their crimes. They are also men with families, with hopes, with love, and with guilt. Jesus spoke of visiting people in prison. They too are part of our community, and yet, and yet what they have done is so damaging, so harmful. Would you want to be known by the worst thing you've ever done? One of my insider students asked. I am not the man I was 40 years ago when I was sentenced for rape, said another. Is it 40 years in prison enough? Those of you my age may remember a soap opera, General Hospital, and the so-called love story between Luke and Laura, a story that began with a rape, a scene not all that dissimilar to that of Dina and Shechem. And this was one of the greatest love stories of 1979. 
can a person who rapes be forgiven? And who has the authority to forgive the victim? The victim's family, the state, the victim? Dina, judgment, is still silent. When Jacob heard that his daughter had been defiled, because defiled is his view of the incident, he held his peace until his sons came in from the field. Jacob is frozen. If he attacks, he puts the rest of his family in danger. If he does nothing, he loses his daughter. And yet, if he does nothing, he shows himself vulnerable to more attacks against him. Before Jacob acts, Shechem's father, Hamor, comes and offers the next step. Let the young people marry, he suggests. My son, he's the prince after all. Let him marry your daughter. More, let's all intermarry. Our sons will marry your daughters. Your, your daughters will marry our sons. We'll share the land and its resources. It's all good. Shechem himself, rash young man that he is, tells Jacob and his sons, let me find favor with you, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Whatever you want, just take it. Just let me have this girl for a wife. And the line reminds us of other ill-conceived comments by people in power who think that they are invulnerable and who promise us the moon. King Ahasuerus has promised to give Queen Esther half his kingdom, and the same promise made by Herod Antipas to his stepdaughter, a promise she accepts by asking for the head of John the Baptist. Be wary of people of privilege who promise everything if we just overlook their crimes. I can imagine Jacob thinking, let Dina marry Shechem, and we'll all have economic and political security. Everybody will be happy, except perhaps for Dina, who remains silent. And Jacob may be thinking, it is better for us to have one daughter sacrificed for the family than to have the whole family destroyed. And plus, Shechem really does love her, at least for the moment. Or was Jacob wondering, how am I going to find a husband for my daughter now that she's no longer a virgin, now that she's been wild? Horrible term. Does Jacob act as a father should? Does he act as a community leader must? What would we do if we were her father? And where is Leah, Dina's mother, also silent in this chapter? What was she thinking? What were the women in Jacob's family and the city of Shechem thinking? While Jacob ponders, his sons act. Unlike Jacob, they are furious at this outrage perpetrated on their sister. So they make a calculated suggestion. We cannot give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a disgrace. The only way we will accept your offer is that every male among you be circumcised. Circumcision is a sign of the covenant between God and the people of Israel. The brothers speaking with guile are debasing the sign. You raped our sister, they are thinking, will cause you similar pain and similar violence to your sexual organ. The Shechemite men, trusting these brothers, and why not? The Shechemites are settled, stronger, better armed, enthusiastically agree. They're not acting for love, but for gain. For Hamor, their king, had told them that if they go along with this plan, all of Jacob's livestock and property will belong to them. And what's a little raid or the loss of a foreskin if the result is economic gain? The Shechemite men then circumcise themselves. They are now in no shape to defend against attack. They're in no shape to move. And Dina's, brother know, Dina's brothers know this. On the third day, when the men of Shechem were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, take the city unawares, kill all the men, and retrieve their sister, had we forgotten about her, from Shechem's home. And thus the rape leads to a slaughter. And Dina, judgment, remains silent. The violence continues. Dina's other brothers came upon the slain, plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took the Shechemites' flocks and herds and all their wealth and all their little ones and their wives. And what will happen to those little ones and wives now brought into the Israelite camp? Destruction, murder, enslavement, and rape do not requite the original crime. All they do is escalate the violence. And Dina, judgment is still silent as Jacob tells his sons, you brought trouble on me by making me hateful to the local inhabitants. My numbers are few, and if they gather against me, I'll be destroyed. But Dina's brothers respond again. Should our sister be treated like a whore? The text ends here, starkly, bluntly. It ends with a question to which an answer cannot so starkly or so bluntly be found, and judgment remains silent. But the story of Dina continues. It has many afterlives. In Genesis 49, as he is dying, Jacob blesses his 12 sons. There's no blessing for Dina. But he does curse also Simeon and Levi, the two sons who planned the attack on Shechem. 
Cursed be their anger so fierce and their wrath so relentless, he intones. I will scatter them. And the tribe of Simeon will eventually lose its land grant. Levites, too, will lose their portion of the land and instead become a lower status priestly tribe dependent upon all the other tribes of Israel for support. That's not the end of the story. The story of rape and revenge will repeat. It always does. Generations later, when King David's son, the crown prince Amnon, rapes his half-sister Tamar, David refuses to punish his son. And later, Tamar's brother and Amnon's half-brother, Absalom, kills the rapist and wages a civil war against his own father, David. So the Bible tells us we can no longer say that rape is something that they do to us. Rape is something that we do to ourselves. Indeed, rape is something that happens in our own family. The Bible says that the story will not be silenced, and the crime should not, must not, be hidden. And still the story continues. The Deuterocanonical literature, sometimes called the Old Testament Apocrypha, includes the story of Judith, who saves her town from Bethulia. The name is a variant of the Hebrew word for virgin. For virgin. She saves the town from an Assyrian agent based in that great city of Nineveh. We hear echoes of Jonah in the background, but Judith offers no opportunity for repentance. Rather, she takes on the role, the avenging role, of her ancestor. She prays, O Lord, my God of my ancestor Simeon, to whom you gave the sword to take revenge on those strangers who had torn off a virgin's clothing. Judith remembers the rape, and Judith will not allow it to happen again. Judith, like her ancestor Simeon, works by means of guile. She deceives the enemy general and then chops off his head with his own sword. Is her story, which has its own share of violence, to be celebrated because Judith acted in defense of her community? Different times may require different responses, and judgment may speak in various voices across the centuries. We can continue these afterlives, for judgment must at some point speak. Here are six ways of continuing our conversation about Dina. First, we're not told what Dina thinks, how she feels, what she wishes for the future. Therefore, we can give her voice. We can imagine her possible responses. Would she rejoice in Shechem's murder, in the murder of his friends, in the taking of the Shechemite women and children? Or would she be revolted by this escalation of violence? Did she want to marry Shechem? Does she see rape as love? Does she want to give him a second chance? Or will there have to be a third and a fourth as he continues to abuse and then, after the anger subsides, speaks tenderly toward her? Or because we do not hear her words, we who are not survivors of rape should hesitate to say to the victim, now survivor, I know how you feel, because we don't. Second, some commentators suggest that Dina is to blame for the rape. Had she not gone out to visit the women of the land, they reason none of this would have happened. They are blaming the victim, which is obscene, and even more so in the case of rape. The Bible does not blame the victim, and neither should we. To the contrary, we might celebrate Dina, who wanted to meet the other women, who wanted to make friends, who wanted to move out of her comfort zone and know people of other tribes and other cultures and other beliefs and practices. Our third point is one with which I still struggle. The story tells us that we cannot know what is in the mind of the rapist either. Violence, love, aggression, regret. Does he even know that he had done something wrong? The crime must be condemned. The perpetrator must be prevented from committing any other crime or further traumatizing the victim. And yet the perpetrator is also in the image of God. And thus we have to be able to see the face of God not only in the victim, but also in the perpetrator. So what is the correct response? Chemical castration? Prison? If so, for how long? Execution? Therapy? Fourth, we turn to the families. Genesis tells us that rape affects more than just the victim. It affects the family, her family, his family, and the community. And it affects the rapist and the rapist's family and community as well, because the crime makes us all victims. The men of Shechem are murdered, their wives and children are seized, and Jacob's sons too will suffer as they are forced to move, as Jacob's beloved wife, Rachel, dies in childbirth on that journey. As Simeon and Levi lose their land, the trauma continues through the generations to Tamar and Amnon and to Judah and to us. Can't we at least acknowledge it and then try to educate all to stop it? Fifth, for those familiar with stories told by a first century Jew from the Galilee, there's an indication that the cycle of violence can be broken. 
the city of Shechem will eventually become a key city in an area called Samaria. And it is, according to one of Jesus' parables, a Samaritan who aids a traveler beaten and left naked on the side of the road, someone victimized, someone like Dina. But here, one from the area of Shechem is a redeemer, not a rapist. Can we live into the future? And finally, for yet one more good question, where is God here? In Genesis chapter 34, God is not mentioned. But chapter divisions, which were only added in the early Middle Ages, are misleading. God is invoked in the last line of chapter 33 and the first line of chapter 35. Silence does not mean absence. A broader vision may give a truer picture. When the voice of God seems silent, sometimes that is because we who are in that image and likeness of God, and we recognize that others are as well, sometimes that's because we are silent too. So we must speak in more. We must let others speak, others like Dina, and take the time to listen to what they have to say. And only after listening and discernment do we act. The Bible is a book that raises the right questions, but more, it tells us that victims require our support and that perpetrators too are members of our human family. That rape and abuse occur in all families, even our own. That violence is no response to violence. And that the cycles of violence can be broken if we offer considered judgment and give voice to judgment and to justice. Dina receives no blessing in the Bible, but that doesn't stop us from continuing that part of the story as well. So a blessing for Dina. May people hear your story rather than close their ears or turn away. May people hear your story and not feel guilty for harboring thoughts of violence. May people hear your story and stop to work such violence rather than ignore it or excuse it. May your father and your brothers come to realize that you are not defiled or despoiled. You are a daughter of Israel, loved and cherished and remembered through the generations. May you find your voice of judgment and may all of us be able to listen to you. And may you and all who identify with you find peace. Amen. <laughs>